Good morning, everyone. Welcome to New Beginnings. Do you notice anything different? There's no Lisa today. So buckle up. All right. Are you guys ready for this? I am. I'm excited to worship. I'm, I, am, I was so excited at 3 o'clock this morning, I was thinking of all of you. I truly was. I was like, not able to sleep, obviously. But I was thinking of, oh, I got to be at church and how long? I got to go to sleep. But at least I get to see you. And that's not just stock conversation here. I am excited to be together in the body of Christ to receive God's grace, a new beginning, one of many, because the S is on the end on purpose. But you all, why don't you get engaged? Stand up with me. Let's pray and ask God to bless our worship. Lord God, thank you and praise you for calling us, gathering us, and giving us your gifts. We pray that you will use everything today, the message, the music, the communion of saints as we interact with one another to grow us in faith, to give us faith, to meet us where we are, to get us from that place to the next place you have in store through Jesus Christ. Amen. One thing I forgot during the first two songs, go back to the room behind these tinted windows and you can pray with whomever's there. <laughs> I never get this. I never get this down. There's a person back there, I promise. <laughs> They're waiting for you. So just go back there. You can pray. Let's praise God. Shout out your praise, there's joy in the house 
of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. Shout out your praise. clap it's fitting it's appropriate it's part of our praise and worship I remember going to a worship conference and I thought worship was singing but then the word worship got blown up for me 
that it was way more than just something that we did in the midst of a room with music. It was God's initiative, his action on our behalf, and then our response, and that that took place over and again throughout the service. There was this God drawing us, God giving to us, us responding, us praising, and that move back and forth became for me a very beautiful thing. Part of that reciprocity is that God initiates and forgives us all our sins, and then we respond with praise. So together, I'd like us to confess our sins. I don't know. Did we, did we switch the roo that? Oh, good. We had it mixed up. I don't know if you guys ever noticed that. And when you memorize it, you kind of like, wait a minute. So ready? We can all do it together now. Let's confess our sins. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We justly deserve your presence and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. With our whole heart, we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Forgive us. Now, here's the thing. Uh, however the words were in order, the sentiment is there. And as I wrestle with each week approaching God with my sins, one of the things that nags me is that I said the last time was going to be the last time. I keep confessing the same things. I mean, in human relationships that I have, I've been kind of put in place. Well, you're just going to do it again. Here's the thing. God will never say that to you. There's legitimacy in our human relationships to grow through that grace. Not, though, if it's going to diminish the grace that's given. And I want you to know this. In this word, I'm going to turn to my Bible in my phone because I had to Google it. From Micah 7, verse 19, we read... God will again have compassion on us. He will vanquish our iniquities. He will cast out all of our sins into the depths of the sea. He forgives us again and again and again. And he takes those sins and he throws them into the sea. That's from Micah. But Corey Tembun said, when God throws your sins into the sea, he posts a no fishing sign. So whether you or someone else, a voice inside or outside, brings up those old things again and again, even if last time was supposed to be the last time, he'll forgive you again. The perfect life of Jesus for you and me, the perfect sacrifice of his death for you and me, his resurrection for you and me, tells you and me we are forgiven. Amen? Please be seated. Travis. All right. Thank you, Pastor Joe. We're going to move into our prayers, our wisdom prayer. We're going to pray about outreach today, and I think telling our story is one of the most effective ways to share faith. And Paul tells his story in Acts chapter 6, where he narrates to people how he was a persecutor of Christians, and then he had this encounter with Christ on the road, and then after that he was an avid person of sharing his faith and praising Jesus and talking about Jesus. And we all have some type of story, maybe not as dramatic as Paul. I know for me, my before Christ or BC was just an original sin because I, I was always in church as a kid. And we went to church on Wednesday night. We went to church Sunday morning and Sunday night. I didn't even know when I was a kid until I moved out that the Super Bowl had a second half because we always had to go to church. We were always in church. But when I, between my junior and senior year, I was 17 years, 17 years old. And I went, I was at lunch with my mom at McDonald's. And I said, Mom, I want Jesus to be a priority and the main purpose in my life. And from there I took steps and within a few years I was in Japan as a missionary. And so that's part of my story. So we all have some type of story of Christ's work in our life. And it may not be like Paul, it might be just a story that involves McDonald's like me. Now, if you think you still don't have a story, just use Paul's, it'll be okay. No, don't do that. Figure out your story. 
If you need help, tell any of us on staff, we can help you process that and figure out what is your story that you can share. So that's the emphasis of our prayers. Please join me in the prayers. I'll pray the leader. Please respond with the all. Heavenly Father, in the 26th chapter of the book of Acts, Paul describes his zealous opposition to Jesus and the gospel message. Paul continues by recounting how the Lord converted him from an ardent prosecutor of the faith to an avid apostle. Likewise, you turn us from darkness to light when we hear and believe the beautiful message of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. We give you thanks for turning us from death to life. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty Creator, let none of us self-disqualify from talking about you. Through baptism, we have been anointed and called. Through baptism, we have been consecrated, ordained, and installed into the ministry to teach and comfort our neighbor. Through baptism, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to us. Lead us like Paul with courage to share our story with people we know and love. Lord, in your mercy. Merciful Father, in Acts 26, 13, Paul describes his encounter with Christ. Our encounter may not be as dramatic as Paul's, but our friends, family, co-workers, classmates will likely relate to our story. Guide each of us in identifying our encounter with you and why we still feel compelled to follow Jesus. Empower us to share the hope we have in you with people we spend time with each week. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. All right, thank you for praying that. And so if you are a newcomer or first time here today, welcome. Thanks for being here. There's so many different ways you can engage with us through either the app, uh, New Beginnings app, or you can talk to anybody here. There is a connection center as you go out the door. You can go there. There's a blue bag for you today, so please take that. There's so many ways that you can get involved here. One of the most immediate one is this coming Saturday, we have Hogan Road Cleanup. So um, it was great to see this week that we have a lot of new trash that was put out there. So it's an exciting time to be able to go pick that up. Generally, we will do between 30 and 90 bags. I don't think we're at the 90 bag level. We're 30 or 40 bags. And so if we get enough people within 90 minutes, we'll get that all picked up this week. So come here at 9 o'clock and we'll be able to do that. And thank you so much for participating in the ministry here. We refer to that as our time, talent, and treasure. And so... As you are involved here in those ways, God's word continues to be here and spread out from here into our community and across the globe. So we're going to continue our worship uh, and of sharing our whole lives with him with our next song. The stars sing, find their way at the sound of your great name. All condemned, feel no shame at the sound of your
thank you. We're here today and we just ask you to, to open our hearts, to put aside everything that's going on rough in our lives right now and to just turn that over to you. Amen. Amen. All right, I think we're in week five in our series on Freedom Road. You know, it's the Lenten series. This is the season of Lent. In case you didn't know, it's that from Ash Wednesday all the way up until Easter. Basically, Easter tide kicks off then. And you have all of those weeks minus Sundays where we're on the journey to the cross with Jesus. And so I, as, a, as I contemplated, what do we want to study during Lent? It's a journey Exodus, where they move out of slavery in Egypt to the promised land, so to speak. And so we've begun a series, walking with Israel out of slavery in Egypt to our present day, where we're also, in our parallel story, going to see Christian from Pilgrim's Progress exemplify a temptation that all believers are inclined to face. You know, Israel, as well as a Christian today, or Christian here named as the protagonist in this pilgrim's progress, where all of us are pilgrims on a journey from somewhere to a next place that God has in store. The clip you're about to watch relates intimately to our passage because we're going into Exodus 20, and Christian carries, like all of us, a burden. This burden that he bears, he's hoping to alleviate the weight of it, and he's told he can go to the mountain of legality to become free of this burden. And this is how it turns out. Legality can never rid you of your burden. So the allegory there is fun to watch just by way of the illustration that it provides. Of course, what we're reading in Exodus is not an allegory. It is history, but it is given for our instruction. I love how the mountain of legality is obviously a parallel in that allegory with Mount Sinai, where Moses comes down with the tablets of stone on which are the ten... No. The Ten Words. Now, Ten Commandments is how we've come to know them, obviously, and that's what they're designated as in many catechisms or Christian instruction manuals. But those are actually called the Ten Words of God. And they're not, for you grammar Nazis out there, they're not imperatives. They're indicatives. You're like, wait, what? So fourth grade, Mrs. McLean at St. Bernadette's Roman Catholic Church and School was instructing us in the finer points of grammar. And I was never really one to participate in classroom study. But I saw an opportunity to be a classroom clown, which I was all about. You could probably never give it, you know, figure that out. But she asked the class for an example of an imperative verb. So I raised my hand for the first time ever. And I think even among all the other hands that were raised, she called me because this was a novel experience for her. And when Mrs. McLean said, Joseph, what's an example of an imperative? I looked her square in the eye and I shouted with all the authority I could muster, get out. It was wonderful. She shuddered in her shoes. She blanched. She was sh taken aback by me, obviously. This little kid, punk. And then what a great teacher. She's like, that's a great example of an imperative, Joseph. Thank you very much. And she moved on, to which later I was sent out of class. So, an imperative is a command. And you rightly called out Ten Commandments, but they're words. They're indicatives. They say, you shall have no other gods. You shall you know, honor the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. You shall honor your father and mother. It's not do this. It's you will do this. And there's a fun application to that observation. Now, I want you to actually crack your Bibles, though, today so that we can see how this is laid out. So on the chairs all around you, there are Bibles, or if you brought your own. If you brought your own, you're going to just turn to Exodus chapter 20. If you're using one of ours, you can just look for page 61, and you'll find the Ten Commandments or Ten Words of God that are listed there. Now, I want to point something out here. Thanks to modern publishing houses, editorial software, etc., Microsoft Word or whatever you might use, you're going to find paragraph breaks and you're going to also find, thanks to Christians in history, verse numerals. But those were not there originally. This was all just Hebrew 
and all of it spelled out these various words of God, nobody quite knew where to put the paragraph breaks. And so if you've been at one kind of Christian church or another, you might even find that they number these things differently. How they number them really doesn't matter so long as we get the words that are there, right? So we're just going to go with the way the ESV or English Standard Version lays this out. Chapter 20, looking down there in our Bibles, it says, And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Take note of that. But moving on, it says, verse 1, commandment 1, or word number 1, in verse 3, You shall have no other gods before me. It goes on. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me but showing steadfast love to thousands of generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's home, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that belongs or is your neighbor's. No donkey coveting here. It's a serious thing. We had a lot of farmers in the first service. No joke. There you go. That, I wanted you to get in the text. I wanted you to see those words of God. I wanted you to note that their versification, their punctuation, our additions. We don't know exactly how they flow or how to number them. So sometimes you get you shall have no idols as well as you shall not have other gods. Sometimes those get c- combined. There's a whole bunch of ways to read this. But ultimately we need to read those words. And when we do, oh boy, what they will do. They give us a distress signal. What does SOS mean? Help. Help. What does it literally mean? Save our ship. Well, from here forth, if you didn't know this, in our faith family tradition, SOS means shows our sin. The commandments show our sin. So you see my little graphic there. You have the two stone tablets with the words of God written upon them by his very own finger. And I put the stethoscope there because they basically give us a diagnosis. They help us ascertain how we're doing, so to speak. God says, you shall do this and you shall do that. Are we doing the shalls? Let's go ahead and look at them and see where we stand with all this sin conversation. So here's a bullet list. Typically, I like everyone to have a sheet of paper with this list on it. And I would like you to go with me through each of these, understanding what they mean, and check a box if you're guilty of breaking that commandment. I'm hoping at the end of my survey, there might be someone here who hasn't done one of them, but we'll find out. So, coveting. What does it mean to covet? To want. I want you to want me. No, that's not what it is. I I think this is the American way. I mean, this is all about getting something that somebody else has, right? I'm like, whoa, I love your car. I want one. Is that a sin? Apparently, (laughs) I actually have encountered the most powerful illustration of this in my children when they were small. I noticed my kids didn't want something until someone else had it, especially the choo-choo. Do you know what the choo-choo is? It's a pacifier. But that was an onomatopoeia in my household because you could hear them when they had it in their mouths. Choo, 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 choo. They're just like nibbling on this thing. And you, you could see them together with the pacifiers. And when one had it, the other one was snagging it, taking it. 
You know, and it's a beautiful thing to see. I know for sure that original sin is there because if you left two-year-olds alone to themselves, one would be killed. <laughs> they are heinous. Babies are just as guilty of sin as everyone else. They just don't have the physicality to pull off their intentions. They would kill you if they could. <laughs> Babies are out for you. So anyway, if you've ever wanted something someone else has to an unhealthy degree, or, quite frankly, sometimes I've felt this, been glad you have something the other person doesn't. I would watch my children with the pacifier. Hmm, I got it. If you've ever had any symptoms like that, I want you to check the box and know that you're guilty of coveting. Next, lying. What does it mean to lie? To not tell the truth? Maybe you guys know what our court systems have learned from teenagers long ago. You need to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, right? I mean, all of us have been there. We've all been teenagers or are. And so it's always a powerful line when we say, well, I didn't lie. What does that mean? I just didn't tell everything to you. So if you've ever used words or failed to use words in a way that even appears truthful but is actually deceptive, you're probably guilty of this one too. Quite frankly, who of us hasn't lied? If you raise your hand, I'm going to call you a liar. <laughs> Let's go. Number two, so stealing. What does it mean to steal? To take something that's not yours, right? Easy peasy. Now who here has done that? Right? Let's go down a road that we all need to wrestle with. How many of you here have worked for pay, but done Angry Birds or Amazon shopping instead? Right? How many of us have been on the clock, but not doing the work that we're being paid to do? Would that be stealing? Ask your employer. I bet they have an answer for you. If you have workers that you're paying good money to do a job, you're gonna, you want to know they're doing the job that you're paying them to do and not just screwing off, right? So anyway, before we end today, I, I do want to go out to all of your cars and see if we have a New Beginnings pen inside. <laughs> Mark is ben, ben over here, he says, those are gifts, <laughs> which is true. But if you've ever stolen in any form or fashion, check the box. Adultery. Now, I've been using the rhetorical device, and no one's been responding, thankfully, because there was a time I had a seminar for newcomers, and I said on this point, who here has committed adultery as a joke, and a woman raised her hand. Everyone else in the room looked sideways. We all turned red. I, knew I wasn't even sure where to go from there. <laughs> I was like, Jesus forgives you. <laughs> It was meant to be a rhetorical question, like a joke, an aha. But quite frankly, as I look out here among all of you, yeah, I can see it. I know some of you have stood at a window pane and watched other people undress. Yeah, well, you're voyeurs. I can see it. You've watched people, as Laverne would say, vodiodo, just standing right there at the window, watching. The window is the, the pane on your television set. Oh, yeah. I mean, if adultery is taking sex out of the context of marriage, if it becomes part of our entertainment, would we be guilty of breaking the commandment? You can quibble with me if you want. But any time we take the gift that God's given, because sex is good. Everyone repeat after me. Sex is good. But you take it out of the ring, the marriage ring, it burns you. Jesus himself said, if you look at another person with lust in your heart, you've committed adultery in your heart. So check the box. Murder. We're just going to go with Jesus on this one too. Who here has ever hated someone? <laughs> like, I, I love the honest folks who are raising their hands. I, I, the, the fact is, every one of us has wished someone else, like, Jesus forgives you. <laughs> The only honest person in the house. <laughs> Jesus said, if you have hatred in your heart, you have the sin of murder upon you. So check the box. Honor your mother and your father. Check the box. Right? We all 
go wrong against our parents. It's just part of our individuation. If you explain it psychologically, the Bible calls it sin. I mean, it doesn't say honor your father and your mother if they get everything right. Yeah, but my parents are terrible. I mean, there are some issues that we need to get the law involved in. But we're called to honor our parents. And if we don't, we check the box. Misusing God's name. Who here has done GD, JC? Debbie, just keep raising your hand. (laughs) She's our sin eater right over here. So misusing God's name, I like to point it out this way. Like for me, I'm inspired by Pixar, Toy Story. Whenever Andy got a new person, he would write his name on their shoe. Whenever we are baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, he places his name upon us. Compare that to when you place a Christian fish upon your car and drive recklessly. That's why I don't put Christian fish on my cars. (laughs) Right? I don't want anybody to know I'm giving bad press to the church here. So, when you have God's name upon you, the good you do, the poor too, reflects on the one whose name is placed upon you. So if you've ever done any of the previous boxes that are checked, you can check this one too. Remember the Lord's Day by keeping it holy. In other words, worshiping is not the exception, but the rule, so to speak. You know, it's basically a gift of God for us to calibrate, to get into the center of his grace and receive the word and holy communion, to be drawn back to our baptisms. It's meant to set the tempo for the rest of our lives. In fact, uh, in the Jewish mindset, the Sabbath day began when you went to bed, not when you got up. So if you stayed up all night binging the latest series on Netflix, and right now you're just agreeing with me like this. In a manner of speaking, you're not honoring the Sabbath. Even if you're here, because you're not here, you're still recovering from last night's binge session. You know, there's so many ways we can skin this cat. So let's check the box. And then finally, you shall have no other gods. And you're like, whew. I mean, I don't have a Buddha statue at home. I haven't gone to a Hindu temple any time lately. But the fact is, regardless of all the other gods or idols that are out there, we in our faith family tradition define it as whatever we fear, love, or trust the most. And I I like to use someone else's breakdown of that. It's wherever you find your identity, your security, and your meaning. You know, for identity, you know, a lot of single people struggle with being single. They feel like they're missing something. And God wants you to be whole as a person, even if you don't have the ring yet. There's a lot of couples that want a baby so badly, they feel like they're not complete. But your completion doesn't come from procreation it comes from the creation that God made you to be I'm not diminishing the struggle or the ache in your heart if you're single or have an empty cradle but I'm just saying that's not your identity same thing with work a lot of guys die shortly after retiring because everything for them was to get up and to go to their workplace and when they no longer have that they no longer have a reason to get up so that would be a false sense of identity security If the market crashes, which it hasn't, it's been amazing, right? The market's been phenomenal, but it's not going to stay that way. And when your portfolio plummets, not if, but when, does that mean you feel unsafe for the future? Does that make you fear for your retirement or lack thereof? I hope not, because your security is not in the almighty dollar. It's in the almighty God who provides us this day our daily bread. And your meaning, what gets you out of bed in the morning? Cycling, of course. Oh, no, I'm sorry. What God has called me to. He defines my meaning. So if I find my identity or my security or meaning in any of those things or like things that I've used as illustrations, if you find yourself getting distressed because something is happening to your security or your reason for being or your sense of self, then you've probably broken the last commandment too. You can check the box. Is there anyone here who didn't check one of the boxes? Yeah, right? Who's going to put themselves on the altar for me today? (laughs) Because you know I've got something up my sleeve. 
Uh, so I intimated this. Some traditions will make you shall have no other gods and you shall have not make a graven image or idol. They make those two commandments and Lutherans make those one. And then Lutherans make the two last ones coveting. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. And then we get into donkeys and things. So, you know, all, all their other stuff. So however you break it up, I just used the generalization and there's only nine. Can you tell he's an accountant? <laughs> Go get your spreadsheet going, bro. No, it, it's a great question. Uh, so anyway, nine or ten, however we play this out, it's a pass or fail. God doesn't grade on a curve. He doesn't say, Bob does numbers better than Joe does, so I love Bob more. No, God says, whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. So there's no like, well, I never killed anyone, which we've already determined you have. But all of the commandments come together as an organic whole. And so you break one, you break them all. That's why we have the stethoscope on the tablets that tell us these are what show our sin, but they also show our need for a savior. If I stayed there, that would all be bad news. It's like when I was surfing at North Beach in uh, Hawaii. You guys know I was in the Marine Corps. You didn't know that I actually surfed for the Marine Corps. Thank you, tax dollars. If we did physical exercise at lunchtime, we were allowed to take 90 minutes for lunch. And I showed my commanding officer that surfing was upper body development cardiovascular workout. And we had an awesome northwesterly swell on base. So yes, I'm not kidding you. I used to surf for an hour every day at lunch in Hawaii on the Western Front. Thank you right, thank you for your service. My pleasure. But there was a day I was out there and there was a guy doing the guppy. He was caught in the riptide. Just his puckered lips were above the water and he was going down. But he now saw his need. SOS, it shows our sin. It's a distress signal. And when the lifeguard showed up and gave him that flotation device, he clung to it for dear life, appropriately. And so we don't go through God's 10 words as a guilt trip. Remember, they're a promise. And they promise to show us our sin so that we can see the Savior clearly for who he is and what he's done to rescue us from ourselves. That has been spelled out in a simple fashion Time out of mind for me. You've probably encountered this. If we were in a seminar again, I'd have you take out a pen and draw a box on a sheet of paper. Better yet, a napkin. Imagine yourself sitting in a McDonald's somewhere with Travis, missing the second half of the game. <laughs> and imagine you have somebody else there who doesn't understand this whole church thing and why you all need to get saved. And if you wanted to explain it based upon what we've already covered today, we show our sin by simply saying God made us to be in a relationship with him. So on that napkin, you write God and us. And then you take that pen and draw two boxes that show a gap between us and God. And then you simply share. The Bible also tells us that we have sins. The ten words of God help us see our sin. And those separate us from God, the Bible says. And try as we may to get over that you know, to be a good person, try as we may to observe the ten words of God. We cannot get across. So you draw like a little arrow trying to jump across, but it leads to death. All of us face that inevitable end. But then you get to cross out sin and death. You hear that? I love the puns. You cross out sin and death. God has crossed over to us in Jesus Christ to bring us back into relationship with him. Yeah, this is... As old as I can imagine for most of us here today. It's a great review. I wish you would have it memorized so that you could distill it for someone else someday. But ultimately, this is what Lutherans do really good. We tell people this news, this message, and then we stop. But I always want to ABC, right? Always be closing. So how are you going to respond to this? You cannot not respond to this simple narrative. You're either going to receive new life in Jesus and can you continue to, you're going to start living with him. You're going to join that journey, the, the road, the freedom road. 
or we continue living without Jesus. How do you want to respond? You go, well, you know, I believe in God and all that. I always love to pose this challenge. Well, the Bible does say that even the devil or demons believe in God and shudder. What's the difference between your belief and his belief? Because he ain't going anywhere good. So let's talk about what it looks like to believe. Once again, on this road of freedom, to get there, we all have to recognize that God has a standard. That's what the ten words are all about. To be holy as God is holy. And then, here's where, where we are down here. In fact, I'd love a volunteer. Could someone please touch the standard that God has in store for us today? No, you can't reach that line. But you could probably touch the red one, which is where we all live. Far below God's standard. And try as we may, we can try and clean Hogan Road. You know, we can try and show up at worship. We can join children's ministry. But we're not going to use those to get to heaven. They won't cut the cheese. No. What's, what am I trying to say? That's just not right. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Welcome to the foot and mouth show. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah, pull that one off, Mr. Hauer. So, <laughs> anyway, we can't bridge the gap. But then there comes a day. <laughs> I'm going to be laying in bed tonight. That's better than forgetting baptismal water. <laughs> That's why you come, right? So our broken red line lives have a cross encounter. And when we meet the message of Jesus that bridges the gap for us, he brings us from where we are to where we need to be because of his finished work. It's when we, according to the Bible, are justified. And I love this. It's a cheesy wordplay. There's the appropriate use of cheese. <laughs> it's kitschy, but I like it. I'm just if I'd never sinned before. You hear that? I'm justified, never sinned before. I'm justified. I am completely perfect in the eyes of God. Anyone who you live with who questions that, you can say, when God looks at me, I'm perfect. Family have other things to work on. So, when God sees you, he sees you cross-eyed. Another cheesy joke, but he sees you through the finished work of Jesus. When he looks at you, he does not see all of those fails that we are painfully aware of. As I said at confession and absolution, he's thrown all of that into the depths of the sea. You are holy in his eyes. But you're going to be caught up in a process from here forth. As you follow Jesus on Freedom Road, you're going to begin this up and down cycle where you're going to say, yeah, I'm excited about God and growing in his word. And then you're going to, I don't know, what's something you do? <laughs> Fail to do what God says or don't do what he does say. So up and down you're going, and this is called sanctification. You're ideally growing, but you're going to fall down and get back up and fall down and get back up. You need to look not at your progress on the orange line, but always look back at where God began your Christian life at the cross, just like God does. He sees you justified. I want you to know that is always true. You can't be partially justified. It's like being pregnant. Either you are or you're not. But you, in your sanctification, it's this process. So you're going to go up, you're going to go down. On a good day, you're going to be stoked. On a bad day, you're going to say, can I be a Christian and live like this? When you deliver words that would cause another person to bleed if they could cut. They're going to look at you and say, you call yourself a Christian. Or in your own heart of hearts, you're going to doubt where you stand with God. You're going to feel guilt. Don't look at that moment. Run back to the cross every single time. That's why we're called New Beginnings. Start over again. Go right back to that cross and remember that God still sees you as holy. And the same thing, by the way, when you're doing well. You might have all pistons firing. You're like reading the word. You've been memorizing scripture. You go on a mission trip. You're meeting needs, generously giving to others time and talent and treasure. You're just trying to live the Christian life, excited about Jesus. It's tempting to look down our nose at others and say, oh, well, you really need God's grace. No, nope. look back at the cross. That alone is where we are made right with God. This process will continue to play out in our lives until the last $5 Latin word comes out, glorification. So justification, sanctification, and glorification. You're ready for jeopardy. 
when Jesus Christ comes back, we look forward to that day, our up and down life and God's holy standard will merge. We will get to experience all of the fulfillment of those 10 words. You shall be holy as God is holy. You shall live out everything without the struggle and defeat of sin. We're on a road from somewhere to somewhere, but not freedom. When Christ sets you free, you are free indeed. You get to live the rest of your Christian life like Israel, like Christian, already perfect in God's eyes. It does not change. Ever. I told you to take special note of the first words that God spoke to Israel when he gave them those ten words. Commandments. He said, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. He didn't say, keep these ten commandments and then I will rescue you. No, he rescued them and then gave them words for life. Now you see the context. You see the biblical background for our catchphrase you hear every week. So that versus because. We want to fulfill those ten words. Not so that God will love us, but because he has set us free. We're on Freedom Road. And by the same grace that we received Jesus, so we continue to walk with him in that grace till kingdom come. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for a day of just simply reviewing some very basic aspects of our Christian life. Thank you for giving us your word and not just commandments, but promises that the struggle we face day in and day out is already perfected in us and that we get to work it out, not for your love, but because we have it already. Let this teaching set us all free from a propensity to guilt trips, from a propensity to bludgeon ourselves and beat ourselves up, let your new beginnings, your mercies fresh every day compel us as we leave this place. Let the rhythm of our lives be set so that we can exhibit to others the joy of salvation. That they will see we are living for you because of what you want for us and have given so freely in Jesus Christ. This we pray in his holy name. And everyone says amen. amen. And everyone stands up and we praise him with gratitude.
shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God, unstoppable. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God, unstoppable. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God, unstoppable. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Awesome. So good to be together. Not disappointed. I just love seeing all of you every week. Thank you for being here. Go with God's blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. So the first thing I heard when I went back to the booth, the sound guy said, cutting the mustard. <laughs> yeah. So Mike Rogers is preaching next week. No, <laughs> should be short. <laughs> anyway, uh, what else is there? So, Hogan Road cleanup. By the way, Travis failed to let you know we're going to hand out freezer bags because it's also a scavenger hunt. We gather roadkill for our annual barbecue. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. No, that's not true. He already told you all the good stuff about that. Good Friday and Easter are coming. There is no Easter without the crucifixion. And vice versa, right? So please make it a priority to come and grow in God's grace as we focus on that amazing and dramatic act of love that God gave for us in his son, Jesus Christ. That's on Friday night and then Sunday. That's the 29th. And then the 31st, we have not just two but three services, a sunrise as well as the normal times. This is a time of the year when people will say yes to an invitation like never before. I mean, we live in a part of the country or world where there is a receptivity to entertaining ideas about God because there's echoes, remem you know, memories in people's minds of what once was. So they might be willing to entertain it. And the fact is, it'd be nice to have them to come because they need to hear what we need to hear. We live under the beautiful love and grace of God, and he's on our side. Amen? Amen. So we live to know Christ. Make Christ known. Have a great week.